The Go Ape Oro Piano Tuning System is the most efficient, accurate, and precise system there is to date. Many people don't understand this because it's been agreed upon that, well, your system is good for you and my system is good for me. But the Go Ape system is completely different than any way that people are tuning pianos today. It is completely different and because of that, it is the most accurate, precise, and efficient method ever. And a lot of people don't understand why. I'm going to show you why today. We're gonna to be tuning this piano. I'm gonna do the temperament and show you how efficient it is. Usually I tune A4 with my phone, but I'm using it to record, so I can't do that. I'll use the fork. We're using the double, uh, double string unison. So I'm tuning every string, every note I'm tuning, two strings at once. People don't understand that. How can you tune two strings at once? It's very, very simple and extremely accurate. First, we make it a clean unison. So the idea is not that I'm listening to two strings all kind of out of tune. No, I'm listening to two strings, but they sound like one. I'm also using the non-speaking length tension analysis because what I'm doing is I'm pulling down on the hammer. I'm using a go sharp ease flat, which everybody uses, but you don't realize why it works. It works because when you're finished tuning, the the piano pin, the piano tuning pin has to bend back up because when you're going flat, everything's flabby. The non-speaking length is so flabby that it would go out of tune very quickly if you left it like that. So we can't leave it all loose and flabby like that. And that's what happens when you go flat. So there has to be something that happens to tighten it back up. And when we're going uh, counterclockwise, it's the clockwise twist that happens when we're finished that does it. But often people don't know that it's not just that. In fact, they don't even know why it works. Um, but it is that clockwise twist. But also if you have a lazy arm, that's bending the pin down. And when you're done, it bends back up. So what I'm doing is I'm not relegating the accuracy and the efficiency of this method to the fact that I might be bending the pin down without knowing it, and that's why it works. No, I'm doing it on purpose if I have to. And if it's a long non-speaking length, I'll have to do it more because that upbending will not affect the tension as much on a long non-speaking length. This is called Hooke's Law. So understanding all these things come together in the Go Ape system so that you know what you're doing and you're not just guessing. making very, very tiny motions on that hammer, and I can hear what it's doing to the pitch. I'm gonna use the fifth partial of F2, so my ear is focused on the fifth partial. Now this, the Go Ape system is all about beat speeds and focusing on single partials. And a lot of people complain about that. They say, you can't do that. You can't tune an interval pure with listening to one single partial. Well, we don't do that. That's why people don't understand. We don't just listen to one partial. We're using multiple tests and multiple partials, but listening to a single partial on each test. And that, uh, that activity of of focusing your ear like a laser pointer on those single partials is what makes your ear improve to the point that you can tune in noisy environments, for example, because all of that extraneous noise, the clacking, the vacuum, whatever, doesn't fall into the pitch that you're trying to focus on at that particular time. So it's very easy to tune in lo uh, loud environments. That's pretty fast. So we got a sharp piano here.
And now a lot of people talk about you gotta have a tight tuning pin, you gotta have a big thick hammer ha shaft, and you know, I, I it, it has to do with the fact that if you don't know what you're doing with the pin, you're gonna be monkeying around with it, and of course you need to have a good solid feeling of it. It's, it's like if somebody gave you a, like a piece of cardboard with a circle in the cardboard, and they gave you another, uh, like at the top of a ma mason jar or something, and they said, can you put that mason jar onto that circle? You would take one hand and move it over onto the circle. That's what I'm doing. I'm just going on one side of the pin. Even though it's loose, I know which direction the pin has to go and by how much, so I just go in one direction. <clears throat> But if that piece of cardboard was moving around while you're trying to put that mason jar lid onto the circle, you'd have to use both hands. And that's what's happening here. When you're using a method that just isn't accurate, you got a moving target and you need to have that really solid contact on the pin because you're going back and forth and back and forth. Aren't you tired of that? I was extremely tired of it and I'll never go back and tune that way again. I know which direction the pin goes, so I only have to go in one direction. That's a bit slow, right? Really slow. And the Go8 system is all about procedures, all about procedures, procedures, step by step by step by step. The check note procedure is that you tune or set the check note so that it produces a beat speed with the reference note, in this case the fork, of about four to five beats per second. That's really slow, much slower than four to five. So the procedure says we'll have to lower this. That's a little bit slower and you know what I'm gonna keep it like that because this is a pitch drop so it will rise a bit if I had my phone I would tune that exactly 25% flat than it was originally shown this is the move and massage technique combined with the bend test when I tune this, I don't have to whack it really hard. That's another thing about the Go-Ape system. Why are we killing ourselves, killing our ears, killing our joints, killing the piano by playing so loud when we don't have to? All I have to do is massage the pin towards the string. If it goes out of tune, it means it's not stable. In this case, I'm able to make the pitch go flat, so I need to move the pin to the right without even listening, really. I just need that pin foot to be moved to the right. Again, I don't need to have a big, thick, st stiff shank or a tight-fitting pin, because I'm just tapping on one side of the pin. Now we have a short, non-speaking length. That means when I massage the pin down and let go and it comes back up, the effect on the tension will be great because it's a short, non-speaking length, and we hear it. Sounds good, let go, it brings it back up the pitch. So I need to move the pin foot to the left. Move and massage. Move. Okay. Now, I'm using the double string unison technique and beat matching. I'm going to make this a pure 4-2. That's a pretty fast beat, and I will match that beat. When I detune the double string unison. 
And when I put it back in, I'm very close to a 4-2. And you can hear that this isn't a 4-2, but it's very close. And it was one motion. This is already double string unison. I don't even need no stinking mute. So we've got a slightly narrow 4-2 here. I'm moving in one direction. I'm not searching, monkeying around with the pitch back and forth, back and forth. Too far. And that's just an out of tune unison. It's, it's, you know, not bad. I mean, depending, but I'm just coloring it now. This check note is not uh, fast enough, eh? Does this piano need a pure 4-2? I don't know, but a lot of technicians are tuning pure 4-2s all over the place. But we don't know. We gotta test the inharmonicity of this piano to find out if the pure 4-2 is indeed the best. How do we do that? With the 6-3. For any piano, when you tune a pure 4-2, the 6-3 could be anything. It could be pure as well, it could be narrow, or it could be very narrow. There's a range. And when I say pure, I mean the major third beats the same as the major tenth. But I can't tell down, to, I can't be perfect, we're humans. And the go-ape system uses that imperfection to make it work. It uses it. It doesn't assume that we're human, a superhuman. It uses the fact that we make mistakes and we can't hear perfectly. So how does it do that? It knows that, the system knows that when we say this is pure, it, does, it might not be. So we need something else to compare with. We'll compare with the 6-3 sounds good, and I know it's going to sound good because it was just barely wide and barely narrow. And if this doesn't sound rock solid, because the beat speed criteria is so good that I know that this piano will sound good as a wide 4-2 narrow 6-3. I know it. I know it. It will sound awesome. If it doesn't sound awesome, it's probably one of the unisons. There's some uh, meowing there. There's a little meow. So you see, the system is so accurate that it helps me improve my unison. There's a rock solid pure unison. That still has some growl. Mm -hmm. 
there's a solid unison, and that sound will be in the octave. It's in the octave because the beat speeds agreed. The pure 4-2, pure 6-3, or the wide 4-2, narrow 6-3, or the pure 4-2, very narrow 6-3. Three different inharmonicities, three different beat speed criteria to give the best sounding octave. So no more guessing or just following blindly, oh, I tune a wide 4-2 all the time. Th this is not accurate enough. I hope I've shown this. Next up, seven beats per second. It's not critical. This might be too fast. This is not Go Sharpies flat. What is this crazy kid doing? The reason is because as I, I'm just slow pulling it down. Well, why is it stable? Because as the pin untwists and unbends, it tightens up the non-speaking length. How do I know that? Well, because the untwisting is causing it to be flabby, but the unbending is causing it to tighten up. Which one is more of an effect? It's the unbending. The journal had an article proving this. Uh, a chapter did an experiment showing that the unbending has more of an effect. <clears throat> so yes, the unbending has more of an effect the unbending is up, it would tend to add some tightening to the non-speaking length, but I'm tightening the string. So the non-speaking length is already tight. I'm at the good spot. Now for the octave of the F. Clean. Beat matching to make a pure 4-2 on this F. That's pretty close, it might be too fast. Now we're expecting a wide 4-2 narrow 6-3 to be tunable here. A, a narrow 4-2 here and that makes sense because if you remember when I tuned that F and I tried to match the beat speed I said oh I think I did it too much that means I moved it too much for the target of the pure 4-2 so let's bring it up a little I, I might have brought it up a half a cent is there any way that you think you could move a single string and, and know that it's moved by half a cent no. Single strings are not the way to tune. I mean, you can if you want. Now that's a little bit wide, so we might, you know, if, if this is an, uh, a tunable as a wide 4 2 narrow 6 3, then we're going to leave it at the wide and uh, hopefully end up with a narrow 6-3. That's a wide 6-3, eh? inharmonicity of this I call a medium scale. If these octaves were tunable as a pure 4-2, pure 6-3, I call them a small scale because the distance between the 4-2 and the 6-3 is so small. This one is a bit bigger, so it's medium. And when you have a large scale, that is you tune a pure 4-2 and the 6-3 comes out so narrow. Uh, but actually, if you try to tune that as a wide 4-2, narrow 6-3, it ends up being too wide and too narrow and you hear lots of beating. 
And it's actually the pure 4-2 that sounds the best because the 4-2 partial is clean, but the 6-3 is beating really fast. But there's a lot of fast beating in the piano, so we don't seem to mind it so much. All right, after this, we go to the, um, the, the skeleton or the contiguous, contiguous major thirds. Move and massage here. Move, massage. Move. And I'm not gonna massage a lot because this is a really, really short non-speaking length. I don't need to massage a lot, hardly any in fact. And if I do it too much, the unbending is gonna cause the pitch to go sharp anyways. Very sensitive, eh? just to make these beat speeds change by the same amount. So we could have a slow, medium, fast, which is ideal. And some people think, oh, it's got to be changing by four to five beats, you know, four to five ratio. Who knows what a four to five ratio is? But that's not accurate. How, my ear can't predict, with a, tell what a four to five ratio is. And how do we even know that this piano will accept a four to five ratio? I've tuned a lot of different pianos where the, when I'm finished, the, I call this the skeleton, F, A, C sharp, F, A. They almost sound the same. And others where it's a huge difference. So this four to five is, it's, you know, you can use it if you want. It'll get you close. And then you can refine till the cows come home. But I, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in wasting my time refining. I'd like to set the pitches right the first time. The idea here is that they change the same speed, slow, medium, fast. For sure, why not? If you can, if, depending on where you put the Fs, you could get the slow, medium, fast. But if you had some error in the F, you might get a fast, medium, slow. It doesn't matter because the A to C sharp will be medium. So really slow, medium, really fast, changes the same. Really fast, medium, really slow, changes the same, but the middle one is medium. Since A has already been tuned, a medium speed with the C sharp will put the C sharp at the same, spa uh, same spot each time. You see, the goal of the Go Ape system, uh, when we're tuning the temperament and the uh, stretch, is, is the f we have the final goal in mind, and that is, for this case, we want to have uniformly wide fourths and progressively beating major thirds. So the progressively beating major thirds, the way we get there is by tuning these three so that they change by the same amount. That gives us that where we want it. Is to develop your ear so you can tell this is not slow medium fast it might be it might be slow medium fast but the, the medium is too slow it's closer to the slow side yes it's faster but there's a huge jump there now if I can hear that why don't I use that if my ear is has the ability to do that shouldn't I use that skill A lot of the skills needed to tune this way, I've proved uh, you're born with. In other words, if you can hear these beat speeds clearly, you can make the accurate settings of the pitch. This is the hardest thing. The Go Ape system has shown that the hardest thing, the skill you need if you want to learn how to tune a piano by ear, you have to be able to hear these beats like they're clean beating sign tones. <laughs> Just like that. Your ear filters everything else out. There we go. So now we have a good C sharp. What about the F? We look at the upper skeleton. 
which has to beat slow, medium, fast. Now this is a, th this comes from experience. This change is big. Slow, medium is pretty big. Medium, fast is pretty big. So what we got here is a really slow, medium, really fast. So I'm predicting that the upper skeleton won't fit because the F4 is too high. That's a big, that's a fast speed. And the FA is slowing down. So it means that we have to lower the F4. By how much? Doesn't matter. Lower it by a small amount. And then check it. And with experience, you'll know how much to lower it so that it's accurate. And here's uh, one of the benefits of an open string unison, open unison tuning technique. You get to find the unisons that drift. I've known for a long time that tuning open unisons was a good idea, but I didn't do it. I didn't want to. It just seemed so ridiculously inefficient. I gotta stick my mute in between those tiny spaces between, and then it falls out, and I gotta put a rope around me and tie these things so they don't fall in, or when they do fall in, I can ca catch them. No, no more sticking the mute between two strings of the same note. All I do is put it between the two notes. Okay, so now that we fix the F4, that's barely, barely uh, narrow, right? And that's lowering the F3, like the smallest amount. a little bit wide. Do you think got a narrow 6-3? No, it's a, still a bit wide. So that kind of an octave, that would pass. If you just tune this thing by ear, people would accept that. But the error in that octave will be multiplied to the stretch in the bass and treble, and we won't get the rock solid tuning that we're looking for. So that's a wide 4-2 and a wide 6-3. You hear that? That would probably pass the RPT exam for a good unison. And now I brought it back in. I think I got a narrow 6-3. And there, that... Boom! That power! Listen to that! That's not what the other octave had. Okay, now we're gonna pull out the mutes, but we gotta keep checking it's full trichord because Weinrich drift can happen where this kind of accuracy uh, is higher than the drifting of Weinrich. Uh, if your accuracy is low, you don't care about Weinrich because the notes can drift all over the place and you won't even know. I know because I was there. Okay, no Weinrich. 
next step, we're, the goal of this is to tune progressive major thirds in steps. The first stage was we got this progressive. The second step is to get this progressive. The whole tone major thirds. This was the tone and a half major thirds. Or the two tone, there's two tones, sorry. Two tone major thirds. Now we go to the tone major thirds. And then after that, we'll go to the chromatic major thirds. So we're cutting up the pie and putting the pieces in between the pies. The problem is, I can't tune that. I don't have any notes tuned. But the inside outside major third major six test says that the major six will be the same speed as the major third. So it's a surrogate. I'm going to replace the GB with the FD and make that halfway. So first, we, this is called the windows, beat speed windows, bisecting beat speed windows. I got a slow and a fast. And this is exactly halfway between. Not exactly halfway between, but for a while we're going to talk about exactly halfway. Instead of that putting halfway, we'll put that halfway. That's too much, right? That's too much. It's a slow, fast medium. Too fast. No, but listen, a lot of people say you gotta tune the fourth wide by making the major third beat slower than the major six. But how much slower? I don't know. Well, when you use this system, which is called the sixth, between the thirds, you know exactly how much faster the sixth has to be. Faster such that it's halfway between the slow and the fast. By the way, the first step here is to play the slow and the fast to confirm there's a window there. Every step along the way, we're going to be using a already tuned slow and fast interval. And if there's no window, in fact, like if it's a slow and a slow, then we've got to correct something. Something's drifted. That's how accurate this is. And this is called the self-correcting feature. tuning this by ear, I'd be like, oh yeah, that sounds like a wide enough fourth. But just listening by ear and trying to make it beat one beat per second, this is not accurate enough. It's not. You're going to be relegated to refining for the rest of your life if you're going to use that kind of a low accuracy technique. And if you want to, it's fine with me. Sorry if I sound a little uh, offended, but it's just, I've been, I, I've been trying to teach this for years and people still, the knee jerk reaction is what I'm doing is wrong. People don't understand it. So they don't ask questions and they just say, oh, this guy's crazy. And all I want to do is help you. You know, if you say, I don't want any help, that's fine. But don't say that what I'm doing is wrong, you can't listen to single beat speeds without asking why I'm doing it. We agree on what works and what doesn't work. There, slow, medium, fast. What's all that about? Slow, fast, medium again? You see how much that slowed down by me putting in the mute? What, my unison isn't good enough? Some people say, oh, there's no winery drift. It's because your strings aren't uh, tuned properly. There's no wine, there's, this is a clean unison. 
Explain to me. You don't have to explain to me because Professor Weinrich has already explained it to me. That's too fast. So how do we deal with it? Lower the pitch a bit. But don't listen to the double string because it's not trustworthy. All right, so we brought that D down a little. Okay, now what do we do? Well, this is where the three different temperament sequences come in. I've, all pianos are tuned the same way, but because we found out that this was a medium scale piano, we use a different temperament sequence now because we, we want to tune this contiguous major thirds, this one and this one, but we want them to be in the right spot. It's not good enough that they're just uh, increasing in speed. We want each of these uh, augmented chords to be in the right spot, you know, in between the others. That's why we have to use a minor third, major third equality, which is different for each piano in harmonicity. So for the medium scale octave, which we've just tuned these, the Fs and the As as medium scales, Y4, 2, narrow 6, 3, this is the next step. The slow, the fast. The slow, the fast. Confirmed, so we don't have any drifting going on. And now we throw in the medium, which is that, that minor third. Slow, medium, fast. That is way too fast. too fast. That's the beats. Okay, that's a slow, medium, fast. Now we keep the mute in here. In the next window. Yeah, confirm. Slow, fast. And the medium goes here. And that's slow. That's slower, so we gotta speed it up. That sounds pretty good. Now, the, like I said, the Go Ape system assumes that your ear is not good enough. So we're going to check this a different way. I just did the G sharp and the C, but let's see if it fits between the G B, temporarily tuned as the F D, and the A C sharp. checking to see that Weinrich hasn't occurred enough that I can notice it. So now if we have that, then the next thing we're going to do is go up here. Our window is AC sharp and 
F G sharp, which is a temporary B D sharp. Yep, there's a window, and we fit in between. Yep. Keep the mute in there. Now fit the F sharp. Between that. So the window here, slow fast, and the medium is there. Notice we're getting to the chromatics now, right? There you go. Slow, medium, fast. Take out the mute and then check it again. same thing we did here except up here. Now that we have the F sharp and the A sharp tuned, which is the goal of the middle section of the sequence, to tune the F sharp, A sharp. And once you've done that, then the, all the pianos are tuned the same way after that. What we're going to do here is the slow, fast, is confirmed, and then throw in the medium. Too fast. And all the logic that I talked about with tuning the proper width of the AD it happens here with the A sharp, D sharp. That's uh, a narrow fourth, eh? Too slow. to choose how much I change that double string unison by the sound of the out of tune double string. I told you that I'm using that major sixth because it temporarily replaces the major third, which I've already tuned. But the major sixth actually isn't exactly the same speed as the major third. It's uh, when we're finished, it's a little bit faster. So when we tune, like, the error that's produced catches up to us. It's, it's, you could probably uh, make these the same speed here, but later on we're going to really try to, to identify that inequality. But what we want to do is tune that speed a little bit closer to that one. surrogates anymore. No minor thirds replacing a major third. No major six replacing a major third. We're just using major third. Just checking to see the trichord didn't drift. slow that is? 
Stand up. So I, I want that to be faster. I want it to be fast like that. So I gotta lower this. By the smallest amount. And don't check it. It's not trustworthy. Massage it down. Good, all right. Next step, we just transpose everything up the semitone. Confirm a window. And fit in the middle. first started using the system, I didn't uh, cheat the major six to the high side and the E flat was often too flat and that made the C flat and the G sharp flat or low. The E4 was low, the C4 was low, the G sharp was low and that's because they're tuned from the E4 as you will see. So now I'm tuning the E a little bit to the to the fast side. It's like a modified equal beating or bisecting beat speed windows temperament sequence. Do I have to do this? No, I can just tune fourths and fifths and then find all the errors and fix them. Okay, I think that's, it might be, it might be high enough. But you know, I can't tell, right? Because my ears suck. Now I already, this is how you finish, this is how you finish off the small and large scale sequence. But the medium sequence already has those done. Check the unisons. Yeah, this piano has a lot of varying tone from one hammer to the other. So the first thing I do is I go with the fifths. That's where the coincidental partial is. down to the fourth, same coincidental. There's beating there. There's beating there. All right, so we got two intervals that could be refined. Here again is the beauty and efficiency of this system. I don't go searching all over for this major third ladder, my, perfect fourth ladder, trying to find out, oh, does this fit, does this agree? No, this is an accurate sequence. I don't need to go and search for anything else. I use the test that tuned a note in the first place to see if it still fits. So the first one, that didn't seem right. Well, what was the first note tuned? Well, the F3, how was it tuned? It was tuned as a wide, slightly wide 4-2 and narrow 6-3. Now we got a wide 4-2 and a wide 6-3. So, 
tune it back the way it was tuned in the first place. You see what just happened? That drifted. And it drifted down. I mean, why did it drift down? I mean, this is a pitch drop. Shouldn't it be going up? I don't care. All I know is that I found that it didn't agree. And it was such a simple way of finding it didn't agree. There's still a little bit of funny business going on there. How was that tuned? In this system, it was tuned between this window. Yeah, that's, that's too slow. That's slow. That's about the same speed. And then there's a jump. So where's all the ma minor, th major third, minor third ladder? What, where's all this? Nowhere. I don't use any of that stuff. This se sequence, is, there's three different sequences that you choose from. Like, if it just makes sense that if I, if I tell you one sequence to tune all pianos, you should be thinking, hmm, that, aren't all pianos different? If I tell you, well, you've got three different sequences that you could use, then you should be thinking, yeah, I guess these sequences are a little bit more accurate, aren't they? And they are, because I'm measuring the inharmonicity first before we use them. You know, you can do it, use this if you want, or you don't have to use it. That's fine. Uh, the reason for the video is for the people who don't understand and don't want to understand. <laughs> This has to come down a bit. Not that they're going to be watching. They probably stopped the video a long time ago. Slow, medium, fast. And there's our fourth back. Okay, what was the other one? That one. Okay, what was the first note tuned? That one. How? Seems to be fine for me. The next note, how is it tuned? Actually, it was tuned, it was tuned one of the first times it was tuned was uh, between that window. Whoa. That's pretty fast. Whoa, that is fast. Oh. So that's fast. Yeah, it's fast, so I gotta bring it up. Let me just say one thing here. Um, when you're looking for evidence to change a note. What you're really looking for is permission because you can't trust your ears. Your ears could tell you, oh, this is blah, blah, blah. And it's like you need permission. And I'm looking for permission to raise this because this fourth wasn't clean enough. Too noisy. It was too noisy. And so that made me think, well, if that's the problem, that's probably low because if there's an error in that bottom note of a fourth, it's going to make it too noisy or pure, right? There's our wide interval. It's either too wide or pure. There's the error, possible error, you know, if we're really, really close. I mean, if we end up with a narrow fourth, then we're way off. But once you get better, you have very, very few times do you have a narrow fourth. And if you do, you'll find it. There we go. Slow, medium, fast. So I corrected two fourths that weren't in tune, uh, that were too la uh, noisy, and with one test, 
not a whole bunch of tests trying to rack your brain. I'm, I'm a jazz musician. It's no problem for me to go through all these intervals and chords and figure out what, how they should fit. But why? I don't have to. You know? I don't have to because the sequence is so, so accurate. Why shouldn't a sequence be accurate enough that you can use it to refine? Now these are fourths and fifths tuned without tuning fourths and fifths. I never once listened to a fourth or a fifth, only to find out if they were too noisy or not. And when I corrected them, I didn't correct them by listening to the fourth and making it beat one beat per second, because that's inaccurate. This is about 0.8 beats per second. That's about 1.2 beats per second. You can hear this has a little bit more life. So the fourths are progressive as well, but we can't tune them progressively by ear because our ear can't hear small differences at one beat per second. It can at five to nine. Okay, now the thirds. There we go. So I hope that was informative. I hope I helped uh, some people understand what's going on with this Go Ape system, with the uh, accurate hammer technique and the double string unison. With, who's this guy tuning two strings at once? This is crazy talk. I hope I showed you how efficient and accurate it is. I will never, ever go back to tuning the other way. Not because I have something against it, but because it, it just drives me crazy. I, I probably could, but it, you know, I got, I got work to do. <laughs> I've got pianos to tune. I don't want to be spending an hour and a half tuning a piano. Okay, so hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Bye for now.